everybody. Thank you for coming. I, I didn't think anybody would, but that's lovely. Um, yeah, so global theme of simplicity. Yeah, huge. So I thought I would just start and talk a bit about me because you don't really know me yet. Um, oh, God, my little clicker's not working. Hang on. No, it's not. Okay. Battery must have run out then. Do exactly what I didn't want to do. Okay, so. Um, oh, God. I didn't choose that in the press, so that helps. I don't want to. Yeah, so a um, little bit about me. So. I do work in the creative industries. I'm a graf I work as a graphic designer. I've been a graphic designer, oh God, for a very long time. Uh, started in the 80s um, when it was paste up and lecture set. And I've had my business um, for the last 20 years. Um, so the sort of stuff that I do for my clients, I design mainly logos and marketing materials and all the stuff that business to business need um, to help them promote their businesses. Um, yeah, so, you know, illustrations, logos, everything. I have to even write down my name on here because I knew I would forget it. Uh, <laughs> um, and you'll see on here, it's I've been coaching as well. So for the last four years, I've also introduced coaching into what I do. So I work with other creative people to help them in their freelance businesses as well. Um, help them with their mindset and just everyday stuff and just be supportive. So that's what I'm doing with those. Um, so the global theme of simplicity. Let's see if I can get this going. Yes, all right, great. So it's working now. So. When Hannah said, oh, simplicity, my brain just went <laughs> That was my brain. <laughs> and I went down a massive rabbit hole ev everywhere and overcomplicated it so much, which is very typical, isn't it, really? Because I think we all do that. But yeah, ultimately, the goal is simplicity. And so I had to, I thought, well, I'll start with the definition because I know what Creative Mornings said, you know, about design traditions of Scandinavian and Japanese um, and how they use simplicity to pare things down. Um, so I looked at the definition and then I thought, well, what do I, how do I use simplicity? So this talk is all about how I use simplicity in design and how I've noticed through doing this, actually, that the rules I give myself in my design work, they're actually what I do in my coaching. So that was quite a nice parallel to discover that. And one of my favorite quotes um, for simplicity is Coco Chanel. Um, I know she's a bit diversive, but um, I like the thought that when she said whenever she left the house, she'd look at what she's wearing and just take one thing off. And that's how we do it in design. You know, you, you look at it and you think, oh, it's not quite right. And then you remove something and you pare it down and make it more simplistic, uh, especially in logo design. Um, that's definitely the rule. <laughs> There's not many rules, but there is for that. So just taking something away that's superfluous and just being honest, really, in what you're doing. I know there's lots of different disciplines here and I'm not going to assume you all know what graphic design, how graphic design works, because I know there's lots of artists here and with artists sometimes it's more, but you do need to know when to stop, don't you? And it's, it's a similar sort of thing. So for graphic designers, the holy grail of your graphic design life is to design a simple logo. Uh, a simple logo will last a business years and it might end up being iconic and I've chosen some logos here which I feel achieve that and they couldn't be more simple. So I don't know, does anybody know what the top one is? No? Okay. That's Deutsche Bank. It's one of my favourite logos. Um, and it's from 1973, 
So it was designed by Anton Stankowski and the slant shows growth and the square is protection. So that is what underlines their business. And that's just lovely, isn't it? And obviously, I'm sure you all know Nike down the bottom. There's a theme going on here, <laughs> and you might spot it. This is from 1971, and I think it's one of the best things ever designed, personally. And it, it, everybody loves it and uses it, and people see, it's a brand people seek out all the time, and it's a real tribal thing. My son plays basketball. Basketballers wear Nike. That's a thing, you know. And... Um, but it's from 1971, and it was designed by Carolyn Davidson. And the swoosh is a wing, and it's a wing from the goddess of victory, Nike. Nike. Yeah, so that's lovely. So it's not saying we're a sports company. It's, again, it's given an essence of what they are. And Apple, obviously. Apple designed in 1977 by Rob Janoff. And the reason it has a bite out of it, there's lots of rumours about why it has a bite out of it, nothing to do with computer bites. They felt it looked more apple -y if it had a bite coming out of it. <laughs> so, nice and simple. And then Chanel, Coco Chanel's, um, she designed that herself in 1925. These are all really old logos, and they are still with us because they are so simple. And that's what I wanted people to notice. I notice this stuff all the time because I'm constantly looking at logos. Not everybody does. So um, it's a really nice thing to notice when you're out and about. Look at logos. I think they teach you a lot. Well-designed ones do anyway. So when, it's, um, when you're designing logos, should you do that for your own business? Just keep taking stuff away. Don't try and tell the story of what you do. If you, if you create a certain thing, that's great, but don't try and tell that story in your logo. The logo is there to make people understand you. It's an essence, and it allows you to change and move in your business if designed well. And it will tell people about the quality of what you do as well. These are all quality brands. And part of the reason we get that feeling is because of how simple they are. If they were really um, twiddly and had lots of little bits on, you wouldn't trust them as much. And that's just human nature. So, so I've... During lockdown, I redesigned my logo. That's my little logo here. And it's simple, so I achieved that. And it doesn't say I sit and do design every day, and it doesn't say that I do coaching. But what it is, it's a person. So it's a person. <laughs> and because I work with people, I work with people in design, people in coaching, and I want them to achieve excellence in everything that I do for them. I'm doing it so they achieve excellence. And that is a little medal, but it's also a V, because I'm Vicky. And the colors I chose were colors that I needed at the time. Lockdown obviously was awful. And for me, I, uh, I just needed to see yellow everywhere, because yellow is really good for switching on all the positive chemicals in your brain, and I needed that at the time, so I designed my logo in yellow, and it's gonna stay. <laughs> um, and I think it says, I'm friendly, I'm approachable, but I'm professional. And it says all that in a couple of shapes. So I think, you know, it's where simplicity really works hard for us, but it is hard to get there. So how do we get to simplicity? in design in particular. We spend a lot of time gathering data, doing research and really looking at the problem. We evaluate the problem and then we develop our ideas, come up with the ideas and we develop them and then we simplify 
and then we have a solution. So it's quite simple. It's, it's four steps, really. Um, a simple way to get to simplicity, um, but there's a lot of work to get in there. So understanding the problem, come up with your ideas, evaluate, simplify, solution. So I take this process through everything, and I didn't realize I took this process through until I started doing this. And this is how I work with my coaching clients as well, because they always come to me with a problem. And together we come up with ideas, we evaluate how that's going to work, simplify it so it can be achievable, and then we move towards the solution. It's very similar. I love this quote of Mark Twain. Because to edit, yeah. it's the editing that makes everything simple. But the edit takes so long. <laughs> so I thought it was just lovely. And at the moment, everything is so overcomplicated. And overcomplicated lives cause stress. So within my practice, and what I encourage other people to do as well is to remove everything that has no concern for them. And we do this, really simple exercise. Um, just take a sheet of um, A4 paper, draw a circle in the middle, and put everything in the circle that you absolutely can change and will make a difference in your life by changing it. And everything else goes around it. So, Everything on the news goes around it. You can't change that. You can be aware of it, but you're not going to change that yourself. You know, if, if somebody is interfering in your life and you can't change, that's becoming too much of an overwhelm because you feel out of control, stick it outside the circle. You're aware of it, but you're not going to change it. So only stick stuff in there that you can change. And the key word there that I love is ease. If you can change it with ease, it goes in the circle, but it, everything else goes outside the circle. And instantly you just go, oh. out of the hundreds of things you're thinking about, there's only like 10 in there you can possibly make some change to. And it simplifies your life. And it's, it really does help. And it's such a simple exercise. And every time you do it, there'll be something different in the circle. And that's great, you know, just keep looking at it. So, yeah, simplicity is a state of mind. And look at your circle. How I, I tend to put mine on my wall, not for long, I don't sit and dwell on it, but I put it on the wall and think, you know, what will be the one thing I can change right now in the circle? And I, I concentrate on that. And that's your 1%. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with a 1% rule. Um, this is life changing. I, I'm working with somebody at the moment. She won't mind me saying this. And she's the main breadwinner in her family. She's a designer. Everything's really stressful. She's not very well. And if the things that were getting her down were things like water in the garden and the housework and picking things up. So we came up with a 1% strategy where she would just do the stuff on the way to the kettle. So as she's on her way to a kettle, she'll do the little things she sees along the way. And while the kettle's boiling, she'll go out and water her plants. And that's a 1% change. And it's given her hours in the evening. It's tiny, really, really tiny, but it's helped step away from the overwhelm. It's a simple change. And other 1% changes you can use, you can delegate stuff. You know, just because you run your own business doesn't mean you have to do everything. Or, you know, if there's something you'd like to include in a, in a piece, a project, and you can't do it and you haven't got time to learn how to do it, find somebody who knows how to do it, <laughs> watch them do it, and fit that learning in as well. That's, that's your 1%. Um, Time, time's a big 1% change as well. 
I've started using the Pomodoro method, which is a lovely 1% change. I've got this really lovely little clock. It's got a rainbow and a little cloud. I bought a child's one. Um, and it sort of the little rainbow and the cloud disappear and then the buzzer goes off. But it's such a little change in my life. I get stuff done much quicker now. And I'm going down my list quite steadily instead of going round and round, thinking, oh, I'll do that later, I'll do that later. It makes me do things. And it's a tiny little simple change. And it's those changes that make all the difference. I recommend the little clock. It's very cute. Um, people. It's a lovely 1% change to make. We all have people in our lives who drain us. They don't have to be there. I just want to put that out there. You don't have to answer their texts straight away. You don't have to take their calls. You don't even have to see these people if they make you feel that bad. You can filter them out. And there's a phrase I always love. It says, people come into your life for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. And that is so freeing. One of my clients, he was really bogged down with the fact that um, somebody who used to employ him, he felt like they were judging him and it was really getting on top of him. He hasn't seen these people for years. And I said to him, was there any reason you could give to why this person should have been in your life? And for him, it was to get a green card. I said, oh, that's great. Wasn't that brilliant that you met that person? You got the green card. You don't have to think about them anymore. So simple, isn't it? And he, he just went, Phew. I never thought that I could not have to think about them again. Yeah, people can be really toxic and half of the time it's you that keeps them there. So think about how you talk to yourself. So I bought, put language at the bottom and that's a really important 1% that I've made, sorry, microphone, um, in my life, um, language. The two words I no longer use in my language are should and try. And it's a massive effort to filter those out. When, you, when I go to say should, I go, mm, think of another word. It's awful. Um, somebody said to me once, shed the shoulds. And I think it's interesting how should is also in shoulders. It pushes you down. It literally gets on your shoulders and pushes you down. That little, tiny, simple change of taking a couple of words out of my language. I don't try it anything anymore. If you try it something, you're never going to do it. It's a get out clause for not finishing something because you tried. You are going to do it. You may or may not succeed at it, but you, oh, I no longer try to do things. I will do it. Um, I did this. This was a huge thing for me. Um, if I tried at it, I would have told Hannah last week that I couldn't do it. <laughs> and she would have been really upset. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same thing. Understand the problem. Come up with ideas how to fix the problem, evaluate it, simplify it, and find your solution. It's the same design process in everything we do. But it doesn't have to be big. It just can be really small and really simple. I wasn't sure whether to cover the next thing or not. Less is more, you see. He, he said... Um, but I have covered self-doubt. Um, a lot of people talk about imposter syndrome. I hate the term imposter syndrome. It makes it sound like you've got an illness. You haven't got an illness. It's not a medical condition. It's what used to be called self-doubt. And it's a bit of a buzz term. And it's used because that's what everybody searches for on the internet. It's a search term, really. And it was a term that was... Um, come up with in 1978 in a um, paper by a psychologist whose name I didn't write down. And it was just a flyaway comment in a paper. And it's become a thing. 
but it's self-doubt. And I'd like you to start to think simply about self-doubt. What does it mean? My coach always says, that's great biofeedback, Vicky. And it is, it's biofeedback. You feel it. You feel it in your body. And with emotions, they're, they're there to be felt. The moment we start pushing down emotions, we cause illness. We cause illness in our body and illness in our minds. Oops. Yeah, so self-doubt comes up when there is three types of change. So there's either visibility is happening. So visibility might be you're having more meetings, you're starting to talk a bit more about a new project or a new service you're offering. Um, somebody's asked you to exhibit some work in a gallery and you're suddenly more visible or there's novelty. So it could be the first time you've done something, you're doing something new. You might be the only person who knows how to do that, which leads to minority. You might be a minority, and that could be anything. So it'll be usually when you notice these, your unconscious mind will notice one of these three things, and it'll go, oh shit, you can't do this. It's a self-limiting belief, and beliefs, and how to spot beliefs is they usually start with I am or I am not. That's a belief. And they usually come along <laughs> with um, self-doubt. So it's something to keep a handle on. And it's simple to do that. So it starts with a thought. I'm no good at this. Which will escalate to a feeling. You'll feel it in your body. You might feel sick you know, which will then lead to a behavior. So you'll change something to accommodate the self-doubt. So you change yourself. So you might become a bit awkward or decide not to go somewhere or decide not to do it at all, which is the result. And then your brain remembers that and it goes, oh, do you remember last time you felt like this? You didn't do it, don't do it again. <laughs> and you can get sort of stuck. So it's a simple four-part what imposter syndrome, self-doubt is, and it's easy to spot. And once you know how to spot it, you can change it simply by just asking yourself some questions. So it's quite simple to change. Whoops. So ultimately... I think a, a really simple way to look at self-doubt is what does it really mean? And it, what it really means is that you care about what you do. That's not negative. That's really positive. So you might care. Somebody might say you might care too much. That's nobody's business apart from you. It's a learned belief. So that means that's great. You can unlearn it and you can change it. And the negativity that you feel is always there just to protect you. And it's a lie. It's not true. You, you can change it. And it's a simple thing to change. It's just biofeedback. Don't let it engulf you. Um, you'll be fine. And what I always say in, to my clients the simplest thing for us all to remember is that we are a creative whole. So what do I mean by that? Lots of people come to me and they're not happy in their work. It's not creative enough. It's not giving them the joy that they thought. They might be a designer or web developer, do motion graphics, do video or whatever. And they're doing lots of everyday corporate stuff, which is not giving them what they need and they feel like a failure in their career and they feel like they might need to move on and maybe change a career but I want you to remember your work isn't all of you you're not 100% work 
that's only a little bit of you. Find your creativity elsewhere and have a job that gives you occasional creativity if it's difficult to find a new role. But what are you doing to change that? Are you training yourself in something new? Are you um, learning to play the guitar? I started doing that. Um, are you crocheting? Are you doing, what are you doing in your spare time that also offers you creativity? And we're so lucky because we are creative people and we take ourselves everywhere and we can be creative everywhere, but sometimes we just tend to pigeonhole ourselves in our role. So when you're saying to yourself, when somebody says to you, what do you do? For years, I'd say, oh, I'm a designer. It's that I am again. I believe I'm a designer. I work as a designer. And if the creativity isn't there from coming through from my clients and there's nothing really to get my teeth into, I no longer beat myself up about it. I'll take myself off and do something else another time to get my creativity out. And that's where your creative hole comes in puts too much value on something saying I am. So to make things simple, simplicity, do less. Um, find a flow and enjoy it. Be fully focused on the task. Turn off your phone, turn off the TV. For, for two years, I haven't been able to have the radio on. I'm just starting to get back into that. It was just too much. And I heard a quote yesterday, distraction is the killer of abstraction. I just thought that was brilliant. Um, everything we do is abstract. Creative thoughts and ideas are all abstract at some point. But if we're not fully focused in the flow, those ideas are just going to, they're going to start to come and then they're going to disappear. I don't know if you've read um, Big Magic at all. There's a book called Big Magic. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I can't remember the author's name because I'm perimenopausal and I don't remember anybody's name. Um, <laughs> but Big Magic is a great book. She talks about how ideas float around the world. They are entities in their own right. And you're only going to be allowed to use that idea if you are not distracted and you are open and you open up your mind and you let the idea come in. And she came up with this concept because she had an idea for a book. And at the time, she, was, she found an excuse to just park it and she didn't use the idea. 18 months later, she saw her idea elsewhere. She thought, hang on a minute, that's my idea. And she spoke to the author, and the author said, oh yeah, I came up with it back here. And it was the time that she'd rejected the idea. She hadn't got, got on with it. So she feels that ideas float around looking for open minds in which to land in and to develop and grow. And if you, if, if you abuse the ideas, you won't have the privilege of using them, which I think is lovely. It just gets you to um, stop procrastinating and get off your ass and have a proper look at this idea as and when it comes to you. Elizabeth Gilbert, that's the one. I wanted to say Elizabeth Arnold, but I knew it was wrong. I don't know who she is. <laughs> and so that goes with trust. So you're nurturing your ideas. Your ideas floated around the world. Everybody's rejected it. It's landed with you. And you've got to trust. Trust your gut. Simple. We are born with this innate ability to feel so much. There's so much stuff we don't use because we switch it off. Intuition is a massive thing that we switch off. Trust your gut, it's never wrong. But it's great for ideas as well, you know. So you, it'll help you understand the problem, evaluate it, simplify it and find a solution. That is the bit that totally does that for you. So, 
I can be found waffling about all of this stuff, mainly on LinkedIn. <laughs> and um, there's links to my design business and my coaching business. But I just want you to, when things feel too much, in everything you do, just simplify it, stand back and just take things away until it becomes just basic form. And that's in everything, design, your life, everything. Um, do everything with ease and you'll find simplicity. That's how I've interpreted the brief this month. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.